Okay, hi guys. This is your first demo on using Adobe InDesign. Adobe InDesign is our multi-page creating software. So where Illustrator is all about making vector graphics um, and Photoshop is all about making and manipulating um, photo photographs or images with resolution. Adobe InDesign is all about taking various assets, whether they are vector graphics or photographs or text, and putting them together into a multi-page document. Um, so that is what we're going to create today. If you haven't downloaded Adobe InDesign, do that first and then come back here. It's the little pink icon with the ID if you have it already on your dock or bottom toolbar. So this is Adobe InDesign. Yours probably looks a little bit different than mine because mine has some of the recent files that I've created. Um, but it also should look pretty similar to how Adobe Illustrator looks. So now that you're familiar with using Illustrator, you're going to see a lot of the same tools with all the same functionality in InDesign. Um, and then InDesign has obviously some additional features to work on uh, multi-page documents. So let's get started. Let's create something new. Okay. Let's work in inches. Um, eight and a half by 11, that works for me. So uh, InDesign will remember the last thing you created, just so you know. Um, so here, pages. So we can start with one page or we can create a few pages. I'm gonna start with four pages. Um, so facing pages is what we want to check on when we're creating any sort of document that's going to be viewed in spreads. So it not, doesn't really matter how it's going to be bound, but if people are going to be looking at it in spreads, think like cookbook, novel, brochure, uh, catalog, magazine, anything that has spreads, two pages next to each other, you're going to want to turn on facing pages. If you're creating a document really for like digital viewing, um, something where you're just going to have, you know, page, 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 then you don't need facing pages on. And I'll show you what the difference looks like once we make our document. So let's check that on. Um, you can set up your columns and your column gutters here if you would like. You can set up your margins. You can either have all the margins be the same or I can uncheck this link and then I can make one margin different. We're going to add some bleed, so every time you're going to have any kind of pictures or graphics or color wash go from edge to edge, you're going to need a bleed. So let's add that in here. Standard bleed is 0.125, which is an eighth of an inch. And we don't have to worry about slug. Slug has to do with when you have a very thick book, think like novel, um, textbook, and when that inside where the spine is, you kind of lose a lot of the... Uh, content of the pages because you can't open the book completely flat. That's where the slug comes into play. All right, so we are good to go. Let's hit create. Okay, so here's our document. All right, so um, first thing I want you guys to do is this is probably what yours looks like. <laughs> um, up on the top right hand corner where it says essentials, we're going to use the advanced mode. Advanced mode, you just can see so many more tools and palettes at your fingertips. I just think it's a lot easier to work from. So go over to advanced mode on the top right hand corner. So now hopefully your InDesign looks like my InDesign. And I definitely encourage you to watch some of this video pause it and then try it out on your machine um, or if you have to have like dual monitors or you can get it all on like your big monitor like watch a little bit do a little bit that way it's more interesting for you and you're learning as we go okay so here we go over on the left you're going to see a lot of these same icons that you're already familiar with okay you're going to see the black arrow and the white arrow they work exactly the same, or the black arrow is your main arrow. It's going to select things, and you're going to move them around the page, scale them up and down, all that good stuff. Your white arrow is going to be about manipulating individual um, 
shapes, it's going to come into play when we scale our photographs. So we'll get back to that white arrow. Um, the next main thing is your text tool, your type tool. All right. So we're going to talk about the type tool, but I'm just going to go through all the icons first. Line tool draws lines. Pen tool, click and hold. All your same pen tools that you had in Illustrator works the exact same way. Pencil tool works the same way. You can draw stuff. This rectangle frame tool, this is how we add in photographs or images um, or any kind of placed artwork. So we'll talk about that one again in a second. This is your shape tool, just like in Illustrator. You want to make some shapes. It's right here. Um, the next one to point out is the eyedropper. You can eyedropper both colors and textiles. So we're going to play with that one a little bit today. You've got your hand, so you can click and drag around the screen if you need to move around, just like an Illustrator, and your magnifying glass, just like an Illustrator. Click, zooms in, Alt, click, zooms out. And then that's where the hand comes into play to put this back centered on my screen. Okay. You've got your color swatches, just like an Illustrator, where the top one is your fill and the bottom one is your stroke. And if I hover, it says stroke, fill. Um, and then the last button is this one right here that says normal. This is um, showing you all of your guides. So if I want to see how this document would really print or export as a PDF, I can click and hold and go to preview mode. So if I go into preview, now I see a gray field with a white piece of paper and those extra guides that were up have disappeared. So this is what the document would really look like printed. And as we design stuff in InDesign, it's really handy to flip back and forth between normal mode and preview mode. So you're going to see me flip back and forth a lot. So let's go back to normal mode for now. Okay. So those were your tools on the left. Really basic. You're familiar with most of them. When we're looking at the document that we originally set up, you can see the black line is the trim. It's the edge of your page. The red line is the bleed that we set. And this purpley pink line is your margin that we set. Um, this is a one column document right now, so that's why you only see one margin, just the outside margins. OK, we can change all of that if we don't like how it looks by going up under Layout at the top, Margins and Columns. So here's what we had originally set. I'm like, uh, I need this top margin to be a little bit bigger. And as I'm clicking, you can see it's changing live. So that kind of helps you get a better visual. I could also definitely like click in this box and see things change. OK, oops, I didn't mean to hit Enter. <laughs> Let's go back. OK. I can also add some columns and I can add the gutter. Okay, now I just made these changes and it looks great, but I'm on page one. I know I'm on page one because on the bottom left here, besides having how much zoom I can do, just like an illustrator, I see I'm on page one. The other easier way to tell what page you're on is if you open the pages palette, which is over on the right these palettes on your right, the first one being Pages. So this is now showing you thumbnails of every page of your document. So you can, I know I'm on page one because of the little blue outline behind the one. And I just changed the margins and the columns on page one. If I go down to pages two and three, the spread, you can see it's how my original document setup was. So that's just important to note. If you change the margins on this first page, it's only going to change on that one page. If you wanted to have all the pages updated, you can either, well, since now there's nothing on these pages, I can just delete these pages. And I can duplicate this page by going under these three lines and saying duplicate or right clicking and saying duplicate. So now you can see I'm just duplicating the page or 
I could have gone up under the master page. So these all have little A's on them. And if I look up here above this horizontal bar, there's this A master. If I click into here, now A master is highlighted, so I know I'm on the A master spread. This is basically like the template for the pages. So anything I put on the A master will be on every page of my document, including margins and columns. So let's make, what do we have, like 1.5 and then let's make the outside ones 0.5 so I linked them all together so they all changed on this page and link them like this 1.5 okay so why is only the right hand page changing because if I look on the pages palette I only have the right hand page selected that's the only page that's blue if I want to change both sides I have to select with the shift key both pages and now it's all blank because they're different on both pages I can type in some numbers and you can see now they are both the same and let's make them numbers that you'll definitely tell that things have changed okay I'm gonna leave it one column so you can see the change on the actual document pages okay and let's make the background color of our we don't want white paper that's boring let's have some colored paper so I just made a rectangle this rectangle tool um, I had it set to a black stroke and no fill so I can swap it with this arrow now I have black pages that's a little harsh let's go over to swatches here on the right so InDesign always default gives you these color swatches which are fine but we also might want to make our own colors so I always like having the color palette so under window just like an illustrator these are all your palettes let's go under color and choose color so window color color that's gonna open your color palette which is gonna, gonna look like it looks like an illustrator I'm gonna drag that into here now I go under these three bars and I want CMYK because we're going to make a print document so we're going to print in CMYK so let's use CMYK colors and now I'm going to pick a different shade of something it seems like a little bright so I can use my sliders or I can use my color picker if I want Okay. there we go nice pale blue okay so now back to pages okay so now I have set up specific margins made a blue background um, if I wanted page numbers I could put that in the master pages um, a couple different things so let's go back to page one and see what happened to page one page one hasn't really changed other than there's this blue rectangle so let's select all of our pages by holding down shift and clicking from page one to page three and if I right click I can do apply master to pages so I want to apply a master you can make multiple master pages in a document but we're not going to do that right now we're going to apply a master to all pages okay now you can see page one changed if I click down to pages two and three those changed if I add a new page with this little plus sign that page matches so now each page is the same as I set up in the a master so if you made a document originally and you start to lay it out and you want to add change out the margins for the whole document add a color background that's all really great stuff to put in the master page and then you just update your pages to match the a master um, so let's put some stuff on these pages so you can tell in my pages palette that we're using facing pages because the thumbnails are starting with a right hand page then we've got two pages together which is a spread and then we have a left hand page maybe you've never noticed before but every single printed document ever after you get past the cover the first page of content is a right hand page and the very last page of content is a left hand page so in facing pages InDesign is showing you how it's going to look printed out and 
reading spreads. So you've got a right-hand page, pages together, and then the very last page of your document is always going to be a left-hand page. So if I add more pages, I get more spreads, where the left-hand page goes on first, and then the right-hand page, and so on. Okay, um, if I didn't set up facing pages originally, I'll show you what that would have looked like. I can change that by going under File, Document Setup, and then I can turn off facing pages. And now my pages palette just has page after page after page. It's no longer in spreads. So we're going to work in facing pages so we can have some nice spreads. So File, Document Setup, Facing Pages. Perfect. And I'm just going to delete some of these pages so I can select some pages and hit delete. Or back down to four pages. That's a little more manageable. Okay, so I'm going to double click and go back to page one. Now, um, let's start. Uh, let's go down the palettes on the right, I guess. Let's see what we have happening over here. So under pages, we've got layers. Again, layers is going to work just like it worked in Illustrator. If you you know, start having a very complex layout, you might want to have different layers happening to keep yourself organized. Links, we're going to skip for a minute. Stroke is going to work just like strokes worked in Illustrator. So if I grab my line tool and I make a line, you can see I can change the weight. Let's see, we would change the color over in our color palette. Let's make it another shade of blue. There we go. Strokes. Um, let's zoom in on this so you can see what I'm doing. Okay. Uh, so if I want to change the default, is you know just to have like a end to your line. If you want a soft edge, click on that one. This makes like an extra square projecting cap. It's called. Um, and then instead of a line, if I had a shape, let's use our pen tool to make a shape like so. Okay. Now if I use this join, so the default is square edges, I can have rounded edges or I can have these little diamond edges. So that's pretty fun. So you can have like rounded corners and a round end cap and if you wanted something, whoopsies, something a little bit softer, like that. Um, InDesign gives you a bunch of different stroke options, so if you want like a dashed line, a dotted line, these like fancy lines like this, you can have um, bars or arrows, and you can change the size of them, like that. Um, so you have a lot of choices for your stroke. So their stroke palette is pretty um, robust. This all looks pretty crazy, so let's just put it back. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, zoom out. Um, then we have our swatches you can definitely create swatches. So like this dark blue color we created on the fly here, I can just click and drag it into the swatches palette and then there it is. I also could have, um, let's use the eyedropper tool and eyedropper this light blue color. There we go. So let's add this to our a swatch palette too. I can also do under these three lines, do new color swatch. and it pops up that color again, that light blue, it's 5% cyan. It default names it the color tint, but if you wanted to name it like, you know, background blue, you could do that too. Hit OK, and there it is. Okay, so we used our eyedropper tool to eyedropper out a color, which is a great use of the eyedropper tool, as you might have used in Illustrator. All right, so those are our swatches. You can also delete swatches like InDesign always gives you these default swatches. 
And like this blue is really similar to my blue. I don't want to get confused. So I can just highlight some of these swatches and use trash them. Like so. Okay. Um, our colored, the color palette is just like an illustrator. We've been playing with that. Gradient tool. Let's make a shape. We'll make a circle. So just like an illustrator, if you hold down shift, you get a circle versus an ellipse or an oval. Okay, so we have the circle. Let's put a gradient on it. You can do a radial gradient. Okay, so the easiest way to do this is to pull the gradient palette out so that you're also looking at your color pa uh, yeah, your color palette. All right, so if I click on this little arrow spray bottle can, you can see now my color palette is showing me that tint, which is white. So I can change that to another color, like so. And then if I go to the black one, let's make that seem like a, and let's make it ooh, purple. There we go. That looks kind of nice. Okay, so just like an illustrator, that diamond is telling you where the is transitioning, the gradient is transitioning from blue to purple, so I can make it a little blue, a lot of blue, whatever. I can also add another color by just clicking on the bottom here where those paint cans are, and it will give you default that the color swatch that is right there in the gradient, so I can maybe adjust that like so. And I have more of these sliders if I wanted to change the gradient again. I'm making like a really creepy eyeball, apparently. Okay, so there is your fun gradient tool. And then if I'm done with the shape and I want to put the gradient palette back, I just click and drag it back into place up here. Okay. I don't know if you guys have access to this Creative Cloud library. If you do, it's just another method to create organize your stuff so like every time you create a bunch of things you can put them in a folder to create a new library and it saves all of your colors and graphics and styles so like here this one has like paragraph styles and character styles which we're going to get into later graphics I don't usually use these um, but it's more like if you have if you're making multiple projects for the same client, the same like brand standards, um, you can like load in these pre-made libraries of assets that you're going to use for every new document you create. That's what the libraries are for. Um, effects. So if you're familiar with Photoshop on your layer palette in Photoshop, you can manipulate the transparency and the viewing effects of individual files or individual items right there on the layers palette. Um, in InDesign, you do it in this FX effects palette. So I'm just going to make another shape so you can see what we're doing here. Let's make it a color that's different so we can see something happening. Okay. So obviously opacity is going to make it more or less see-through, like so. But the more fun one, if you haven't played with these um, blending modes in Photoshop, you can definitely try them out here and in Photoshop. Um, you can kind of see they all do something a little bit different, and they just kind of give you like a another kooky way to create interesting visuals. Um, so there you go. Let's do that one. That's kind of fun. All right. And if I, again, switch back over to preview mode, all of those blue outlines disappear <coughs> so that I can see what I'm actually creating. So that's kind of fun, right? Go with that for now. Okay. I can go back to normal mode and see everything. Okay, and then we're not going to talk about styles yet. That will be a future demo. Okay, so now at least we have basics of what Adobe InDesign does. Um, a lot of the same features that you've used in Illustrator 
creating flat graphics, all these graphics that we've created, these shapes and lines, these are all vector. You can copy simple vector graphics right out of Illustrator and place them into InDesign and they are still vector and you can still manipulate them. Um, if you have a very complex uh, Illustrator file like you've done an illustration or something with a lot of points, I would not recommend copying it and pasting it into InDesign. I would recommend just bringing it in, bringing it in as linked art which we will go through in a future demo. Um, but just so you know, like simple stuff you make in Illustrator, you can definitely paste into InDesign. Okay, so now let's add some text since that is really where InDesign shines in handling large blocks of text. So we're going to use this text tool. Unlike in Illustrator where you could just like click and type. In InDesign you have to draw boxes. So I'm going to just click and drag and make a box. You can see my cursor is now flashing. And here I can type in the box. By triple clicking I select the type. Otherwise I could do Control A or Command A to select all. I can do I think Edit, Select All, or I could click and highlight. However you want to do it, select the text you want to change. So if I want to change the font, I want to change the font size. This is the letting, the space in between the lines of text. So let's just put some returns in here to give you multiple lines of text. So all these boxes, I can type numbers in, I can use the pull down, or I can use the up down arrows. And you have to, whatever you're selecting is what you're manipulating. So, right, so if I wanted to make this one word bigger, like so. All right. And then the default is left aligning text, but up here, this is why I love advanced. All your tools are right here for you. I can make it centered in the box. I can make it right aligned. This is justified, which you're not going to see because there's a hard return there. There you go. Just justified. Oh, it's not enough text. Okay, copy, paste. There you go. Justified. So it's forcing it to fill left to right except for the very last line is just going to be left aligned or forced or centered. That's justified. Okay, that looks crazy, so let's just get rid of that. Okay. All right, we can change the color, go over to our colors palette. Let's make it colors. I can also use the eyedropper tool and pick out colors in my artwork. So that's that kooky gradient, which looks kind of fun like that. Um, so I can do that. This one I could pull that. Oh, that didn't do it. Yes, it did. No, it didn't. Oh, so it's pulling the color of this box, which if I pulled it all the way here, you would see that it's pink. That's why this type is now pink. Um, but we have that um, blending mode on it, so it doesn't look pink right now. So if I wanted to get that dark blue color for the color of the type, I can't do it with the eyedropper. But I could do it with the swatches, because we made a swatch of that color. So there you go. Let's do that. Okay. So that's the type tool. Um, so if I want to edit the type once I've clicked out of the text box, I have instead of using the black arrow, I have to use the text box arrow of oh, the text tool. So then I can click into the type and I can manipulate the type. Um, this is the tracking to make equal spacing on a line of text, out or in, like so. 
Um, this one above it is for the kerning, which is manipulating the space between a single pair of letters. So um, in design, you always want to make sure that each letter within a word and is optically has equal amount of space, optically equal spacing. Um, so we only do this on headlines. You don't kern body copy. But like on this one, I would say there's like maybe a little too much space between the P and the E. So I can come up here and do like a minus sign. And you can see now it's pulling the P and the E closer together. Plus number would pull them further apart. Zero would be the default. Um, your key command is holding down Alt and then using your right or left arrow to pull things closer and further away. That's like a really handy key command. So there you go. So that would be kerning. Um, other things up here. So this is your uh, vertical scale and your horizontal scale. Do not use these buttons. <laughs> what they do is they manipulate the letter forms by stretching them or squashing them, like so. It's a typographic and design no-no to distort the type like this. If you need a condensed typeface, go find a condensed typeface. Don't manipulate a different typeface that is not meant to be used like that. Okay, there's like a gazillion and a half typefaces. Go find one that will work for you. Same thing with like, oh, I want this typeface to be a little more condensed. No, we're not going to do that. You will get all your design associates will mock you. Okay, so don't use those buttons. Similarly, if you have a typeface that doesn't have an italic version to it and you needed an italic, you're not going to use the skew tool. You're going to go find a different font that has an italic variation to it. Okay, again, type crime. Don't commit crimes. Okay, so those are the buttons you're not going to use. Um, other really handy basic typing feature is if I just have the black arrow and I select this box. So when you're typing in a box, it default types to the top, aligns to the top of the box. But sometimes when you're aligning stuff, it would be more handy if your text aligns to the center of your text box or the bottom or justified vertically to fit the height of your text box. So that is all these little buttons on your top bar with your black arrow on, not the type tool on, but the black arrow. So like here's a really good way why I would want to use this. So if I want to like align this to this bar. Now I can align it to the bottom of my type box. Like so. Like that. Okay, so that's a cool one versus here, which obviously you can line it up anyway, but sometimes it's easier to like not have extra type box at the bottom. You'd rather have it at the top or whatever. I just think that's a good thing to point out, how you can align the type within the box right there. Okay. So those are some basic typing features. So when you have when you're designing something with text, usually you get the text provided to you. It's usually in a Word document. And then you usually copy the text out of the Word document and you paste it in InDesign. So that's what we're going to do right now. So I have pull, or thrown up on Blackboard an exercise called InDesign Tutorial 1 or something like that. You'll find it and there is some text in there. So I copied it out of Word or out of Blackboard and pasted it here. Oopsies. No, I didn't. <laughs> Let's try it again. Copy, paste. So paste is just Control V, Command V, Edit, Paste. Okay, so it's an excerpt from the novel, A River Runs Through It. So I just pasted it into a text box over here on my artboard on the side of the page. 
all of the text is not shown, I can tell that by this angry red square at the bottom of my text box. That means there is more text than you can see. So we'll either have to make multiple text boxes or make the text smaller so that it fits in the space. You have a few different choices, but we'll handle that in a second. Let's start with just typesetting the title here. So I'm going to cut this out and then I'm going to paste it in a new text box over here. All right, so let's pick a font. So when you're looking at your fonts, um, the numbers and the parentheses tell you how many variations that font has to it. Um, so that's just handy to know when you're trying to pick a font and you know you're going to want a few different font variants as you design this. You can also probably see that it's showing you how the font looks both in this drop down and on your actual page as you hover over different fonts. So we're going to pick this. Alright, so I want this to be the biggest thing because it's the title. I think I'm going to try to center it all on this random shape we created. We'll use our margin here. Okay. And oh, one other good thing to know is designers hate hyphens. So there's this little button right here that says hyphenate that like always default is on. Let's turn that off. Ugh, much better. Okay. Um, another fun key command is oops. Well, let's see. That's the carding. Oh, maybe I don't know it on a PC. Never mind, I was going to change the font size. <laughs> we'll just type it in instead. Okay. Alright, so a river runs through it. We'll make that bold. Pull in the letting a little bit. Let's do, um, if I want to make something all caps, a really easy way to do that is to do this double T button right here. Now that's all caps. I'm going to track that out really wide, well, even wider. I'm going to type a number in here. You can go up to like 9,000 or something ridiculous like that. All right, so we're going to do that. I'm going to change the width of this box to be more like equal to this. So that's centered. Um, Norman McNeil, the by, we should capitalize that B. Okay. Let's see, make that bold too, a little bit bigger, and increase the letting, so push it down a little bit. Right, let's see how that looks, let's go to preview. That's not bad, the whole thing is way too close to the top here, right? There's like no margin, that looks pretty bad. Let's see, what if we push this down below the line? looks better. And maybe I'll make that blue to match the line color. There we go. That's looking kind of nice. So I kind of want to pull out like the purple and the pink to use on some of this stuff, but this was in the gradient. So while you can save a gradient swatch to use again, like so, if I want to get the actual colors of the gradient, I have to come back to the gradient palette click on this and then open it in the color palette and here's that's the purple so now on the color palettes I can go to these horizontal lines and go add to swatches and now I have oops no that didn't work just kidding here it is here's uh oh okay that just made that whole box purple let's see all right, let's try this again. Be in normal mode so I can see what I'm doing. All right, I'm going to click on the purple. I'm going to go to color. So now I have the purple loaded. I have to click off of the gradient. That's not going to work. Let's see. You are watching me solve this in real time. There is definitely a way to get this color. If I draw a square as purple. 
Okay, we're going to have to do it the manual way. Right, remember these numbers, 66, 100, 0, 49. 66, 100, 0, 49. I'm sure there's a way to do it. I just can't figure it out at the top of my head. So there we go. Now we'll save the swatch. There you go. Let's see. And then the pink I know I can get because that pink is just a pink square. So I'll use the eyedropper to get the pink, which looks white, but we know it's pink because we showed us. I showed you that earlier, right? If I put it back on white, it's pink. Okay. There we go. This looks okay. All right, so I feel like the whole thing is kind of high on the page, though. Let's move that down. So I'm just going to select everything by clicking and dragging with my black arrow to select it all, because I don't want to select this copy box over here. I can either hold down Shift and then click Drag to not move it horizontally, just move it vertically around the page. I can also, just like an illustrator, if anyone adventured over to the properties palette, you can move stuff by using the X and Y axis, right? So X is side to side and Y is up down. So if I want to align from the top of all this stuff, I can type a number in, like so. All right, so there's a few different ways to move things. All right, that looks pretty good. So now I'm going to take this block of text and I'm just going to drag it to the next page. Okay, because if you recall, we're making a four page document. So let's call that our cover. Now let's work on this first spread. So if this was an actual book, this left hand page is the inside front cover and the text would really be starting on the right hand page. So we'll do that too. So we're going to put this text over here. I'm going to use the margins as my guide. I'm going to go to, sorry I use the key commands, I don't even think about it. Okay, if I hit the T on my keyboard it'll go to the type tool so I can edit the type, otherwise I can just go to the type tool on the side here and then click into the text box. I'm going to delete out some extra spaces. Okay, so here is our text. So I'm going to zoom really far out so I can see both pages. Okay, so one cool thing that the eyedropper tool does is you can eyedropper text styles. So I'm just going to highlight, we'll just highlight this first paragraph so you can see it in action. Then I'm going to grab the eyedropper tool and I'm going to click on this an expert from, an excerpt from, and then you can see, if I come back over here, now I've picked up that style. So that's pretty neat, right? So if you want to like bold certain things or you want to have, you know, your all your headlines look a certain way, you can definitely use that eyedropper tool to quickly copy paste textiles from one thing to another. So um, maybe we'll leave the in our family in that tracked out pink. I'm going to highlight the rest of it and eyedropper the body copy here. So it's back to the same thing. Okay. And we don't want this one to be tracked out. That's weird. Okay, perfect. All right, so that's kind of fun. Um, let's see. I know I was using a serifed font, but I don't think it's the same serifed font. So let's check. This is Alio. So we want all of this to be Alio. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this out and put it over here so I don't lose it. And then I'm going to select everything, so control A or edit, select all. Let's change this back to, um, we'll do a different font. We'll do a sans serif font for a little variation since we're using 
a serif in our headline. Let's see, where is a good sans serif? Here you go, acumen. And this one has 91 variations to it. It's definitely like a super duper family. We'll stick with regular. Um, so in typesetting, like just general like body copy, like text type, it's usually 10 over 12, 10 point font, 12 point letting. That's like default, easy to read size text you usually see on most things. Think like books, magazines, that kind of stuff. You can definitely go a point smaller or a point bigger, um, depending on the actual font you're using. And you can definitely like lead stuff out if you want to make it feel a little bit more airy, right? Or squash things in if you want to make it feel darker and denser. Um, for easy readability, um, I would say you stick with your 10 over 12 as your starting point and then you can kind of adjust things from there. I actually feel like this font has a pretty high X height, so I'm going to give it a little extra letting to make it a little easier to read. Uh, I think that looks good. Alright, and I'm going to paste this first few words back in here. Perfect. I don't know, maybe I don't want that one to be. Let's do that. Uh, Okay, I think that looks okay. Alright, so long blocks of text. You need to be able to denote new paragraphs to make it easier for the viewer to read this copy, right? If I switch over to preview mode, it's kind of hard to read. It's kind of a giant block of text. <laughs> um, so to find the paragraphs, I can definitely go under type show hidden characters. Type show hidden characters. And then if I go back to normal mode, now, let's zoom really, really far in here, there are paragraph symbols at the end of each paragraph, and there's little dots for every space, so like after this period, we don't need double spaces between periods, so I could be going around looking for that as a designer and fix that. Um, so, how to separate out paragraphs. One way is to put tabs, right, put indents in at the front of every paragraph. So I might want to go through and add some indents. So I'm just looking for the end of the paragraph symbol, and then the next line I know I need to tab. So I could do that. Like so. If I go back to preview, you can see what that looks like. Um, so your default tab is, you can change the default tab if you don't want it to be that much or you want it to be even more. We can go under um, Type, Tabs, and you can click on the ruler to make tabs, and I can click and drag to change the tab, and you can see it changing in real time, like so. So you can do tabs to separate out paragraphs. That's really common in reading books, novels. Um, another option, let's see, or we can use, delete out these tabs, spaces between the paragraphs is another good option for denoting individual paragraphs. So what we're going to do there is at the top here, there are a few of these options in the center of your toolbar. The very last one is space after paragraph. So if I click that, you can see now there is an extra space being put in between every paragraph. Every time you see a paragraph symbol, it's adding more space. And you can use the up down arrows or you can type any number you want in here. Okay? Um, so you can do space after a paragraph. You can do space before a paragraph, which is going to look the same. <laughs> um, but usually best practice is to do space after, not space before. You can indent the first line 
of a paragraph. So just like how we were putting in those tabs with the keyboard, if you don't want to put in tabs with the keyboard, you can just do it this way. It does the exact same thing a little bit faster. You don't have to worry about missing a paragraph block to put in a tab. Um, you can also, if you had a certain paragraph, like here's a little paragraph, maybe you wanted, this was like special copy and you wanted to pull it in even further than the rest of the copy. I can use these buttons here, so that's changing the margins of just that type. So just the stuff that's selected is the stuff that's being affected. So maybe this is going to be centered and it's going to be like bold and big because this is like a special call out to the copy, which obviously we know it's not because this is a novel, but just we're pretending. And we'll make it a color. So it swatches. Come on, computer. We'll make it purple. I see we never made a swatch for our pink. Let's make that a swatch. Okay. All right, so those are some cool features. Now, let's see what it looks like in preview. So there you go. So if you wanted to like call out certain text, you could do it like that. Um, so one thing, so you saw me like briefly push this eye down. So when you're typesetting like these little bitty words, you don't really like hanging off the edge of a line like that. It doesn't look as good. But if I just hit enter, I would get too much space between those two lines of text, right? Because we told it space after. So instead, I can hit shift return, and you can see that invisible symbol changed. Now that's called a soft return. Um, so it's just pushing that word down to the next line. It's not forcing a paragraph return. So shift return or shift enter on your keyboard it's how you make soft returns. And those are really important as you start to typeset blocks of text um, when you want to push certain words down to change your the way your paragraph is looking. Ooh, so one thing I didn't do is take out these hyphens. Let's so select all and uncheck hyphenate. Oh, that's better. Okay. All right, so that's not bad. Usually you wouldn't have space after and tabs, usually it's one or the other. So maybe we should fix that. Uh, but so now how this one is special now, that's why all of this is kind of being wonky. But I think if I put in a zero here, there we go, it fixed it, okay. So if you have stuff highlighted that has different styles to it, that's when the things that are different just blank out. So in this instance, the thing that is different is this call out text that we created has different margins so that's why these two things are different are blank right now versus if we just select the black text they're all zero if we just select the purple text they're these two numbers which are not the same which seems weird okay okay all right so that's looking not that's looking kind of fun right Okay, now if I go back to normal mode, I definitely have more text than what is on this one page. So let's add, we're going to link our text box to another text box. You can link text boxes amongst the same page or from page to page. So it's really simple. You just click on the text box that has too much text with the angry red square. You click on the angry red square and now you can see my cursor has like loaded text in it and I can click and draw a new text box and the type auto fills into the next box which is really cool. Um, your other option would be you can draw another text box first and then I can click on this angry red text box and then link into this existing text box. So either way, you can either have text boxes already created and then link from box to box, or you can create boxes as you go. 
So I know I've made it to the end of my content because I see this pound sign. Pound sign means end of story. So there's no more content. Like so. So there you go. So if I went into preview mode, I can zoom out. I can see what this looks like from page to page. Maybe this page, since it's now like an interior page, maybe I want the margins to be a little bit different. So let's see. What are the margins? The X is 1 and the Y is 1.5. So let's make the Y 1. That way it starts centered. Yeah, that looks better. So there you go. So now I've set a cover, my inside cover, which it would be really common to make like the inside cover something special, like either a photo or different color block, something like that. Right? And then the document would continue with the rest of the story. So other things, I'm going to make sure you save your work as you go. Save this file. Save. What are we going to call it? Oh. Let's put it somewhere good that we don't lose it. Let's call this demo one typesetting. Save. All right. And so our last cool advanced feature that we are going to learn is how to add page numbers. Because assuming that we were going to typeset a whole book or a whole excerpt, we would want page numbers. So if I click back into this A master, go back to normal mode, I'm going to put page numbers on the bottom. I think I'm going to center them below this margin. So I'm going to draw a text box. Um, so let's see. This I can go over here. If I go to the bottom, now I can measure from the bottom of my text box. So I want, let's say, I want at least a half inch margin on the bottom of the page before the page number. So that would be 10.5 because it's an 11 inch tall page, right? Right. So there you go. All right, so now I'm clicked in the box, and I'm going to go up here under Type, Insert Special Character, Markers, Current Page Number. Okay? Type, Insert Special Characters, Markers, Current Page Number. And I get this A. And now I can format this A to, let's see, let's use the Alio, the serif font that we were using. Uh, we'll keep regular, but we'll make it small, we'll make it like 8.5 point. And I'm going to center it. And this is where that whole aligning your text boxes business comes into really handy, because I want the A in the bottom of this text box, because then that would be half an inch from the bottom of my page, like so. And I can change it to a different color, however you want your page number to look. We'll make it pink so you can tell. Okay, so now I have a page number. Now, it's important to note that I only have the page number right now on the right-hand page. That means that if I click into page 3, there's a page number, but if I added another page here, you can see there's a page number on the right-hand page, but not the left-hand page. So I probably want page numbers on every page, because that's more normal, isn't it? So let's see, I can just duplicate this box by holding down Alt, just like an Illustrator. I can duplicate it and put one over here. So now I have a page number on both pages. So let's go back here to page 4, 5. Now I have pages 4 and 5, so perfect. Now, you don't usually want a page number on the cover. And I don't really need one on this page, except in this instance you can't see it because they're the same color of pink. So I can do, I've got two options. The first option is I can right click on page one and click override all master page items. 
This allows me to select not only the page number and delete it, but things like the background color if I wanted this one to be a different color, like so. My other option is I can um, change it from an A master to maybe this none page. So if I go to apply master to pages and I choose none, that got rid of the page. So it still looks blue because the A master page has the blue going all the way across, but you can see that there's no page number here anymore. And this pink box is on top of the blue box, so it doesn't really matter. So that's fine for what we're doing. Another thing I could do is I could create additional master pages. So if I was up here at a master, I could go over here and do new master. So it just B. And on this one, I'm just going to have no page numbers um, and I'll make it a different color background so you can see the difference. Okay, we'll make it blue. Alright, so now if I go to page 4 or 5, I can change page 5, apply master to pages. I'm going to choose B. And now you can see the margins changed. There's no page number. Uh, except I'm not seeing the blue. So let's see, we can fix that if we go up to the master pages. Let's go to layers. Let's make a new layer. Make this on a top layer. So what that's going to do is let's make it a single page wide. Here, make this single page wide too. Okay, so now if I go here, you can see now it's blue. It was just because the A master rectangle is a spread wide, so if I change this to be two pages wide too, you'll see that it'll change on that pink inside front cover layer also. So now if I move this back, it's white. Subtle to see because white and light blue are very similar, but it's white now. Okay, so that's why that was looking weird. But anyway, um, that's how another way I could change the pages to have some pages have page numbers and some pages to not um, if I don't want my cover to have a page number. You can, there is also a way to <laughs> change it where you don't want this to start on page three, but to start on page one. Um, <clears throat> if I right clicked on page, what is currently page three, and did numbering and section options, we can start numbering on page one for here as a new section and hit OK. And now you can see it's page one. This <coughs> start to screw up your exporting because now you've got two page ones. So Let's change this to um, add a prefix to it, or we can do it like ABC. Now you have AB, then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. And again, if we highlight these pages and right click and do apply master, we can put them back to master A, like so. Okay, so there is your basics on how to add and format text into Adobe InDesign. So definitely go in, grab the A River Runs Through It text excerpt, and see if you can't format the text however you want it to look. I'm not judging your aesthetics. I just want to see you try to use some of the different text features link some text boxes together and start to get comfortable using Adobe InDesign. Alright, good luck and have fun guys.